Uh, I'll just set a bit of the background um, for Coventry. Uh, we're a unitary authority, <coughs> um, traditionally part of uh, Warwickshire. We've been our own county for 400 years um, over the, the centuries. Um, we've got very little evidence of prehistoric Roman archaeology. We've got the Lunt, we've got um, some, some Iron Age settlements, but, but otherwise very little. The main focus for Coventry was <clears throat> during the, um, the, the Saxon periods where we had a nunnery for St Osberger, then we had Lady Godiva and um, Leo Frick creating a um, Benedictine monastery. Uh, we had the city divided into two parts, so we had the Earl's half and the uh, Prior's half, <clears throat> but we had some fantastic walls. We've spawned phrases like sent to Coventry because of the strength of the uh, the city walls, Peeping Tom and Lady Godiva, uh, True as Coventry Blue because of the cl cloth and dyeing industry, which made Coventry one of the, uh, the most wealthy um, cities in the country. <clears throat> Uh, we had a, a period of um, sort of like economic decline during the post-medieval period. We really sort of like grew during the early 20th century in the uh, motorbikes, uh, bicycle industries, which turned into the um, the war effort. Hence, we were uh, suffered quite badly during the Blitz, uh, which destroyed a large portion of the medieval city and the monastery, um, the the cathedral. And that's actually a picture of the um, the rebuilding of the cathedral. In 1955, um, and you can see the the um, stone lined coffin with, with a worker just digging around it. Obviously, we didn't have WSIs back then to control the work, so it's just me covering Coventry. I do all the development control. I do the the HER everything. We do have a conservation officer, so I get to palm off um, listed buildings and things to them, um, which is which is fairly good. We've got no dependent no tiered authority so i don't have to give advice to anyone outside of coventry i sit within the planning department so i'm probably quite an enviable position because i don't actually have to justify my role i don't have to get funding uh but equally i don't have any funds to spend for rescue archaeology if we've got heritage at risk i have to go cap in hand to other departments and try and get things from their um, budgets got quite a few um trusts within the city uh, which manage their own archaeological area or historic area which is very good apart from the lack of communication between us and them so they'll be planning to do things uh, and then at the last minute they'll tell me and I'll go well actually no there's issues there I'm quite lucky uh, that the museum has a really um, active archiving program and they take most of that um, task away from me so WSIs, for my, um, um, because it's just me, the WSIs that I require are mainly focused on the fieldwork aspects, so watching reefs, evaluations and excavations. <clears throat> Sadly, I don't have time to produce briefs. If I did produce briefs, then that would draw the my resource away from the, consult the consultations and things. So uh, I'd fall behind on those. So I've got to prioritise the time. Uh, and so that's why it's just WSIs for the fieldwork side of things. It's not ideal, but because it's just me and until I manage to clone myself or get an assistant, it's sadly not going to change. At some stage, I will be producing briefs. So a brief for, w, uh, for uh, DBAs, maybe even a specific brief for WSIs. Um, uh, and things and, and I think that will help but again it's capacity and resourcing so the WSIs that I do require um, <clears throat> what do I ask for I'm just, just make, make sure I'm at the end of the things I mean obviously the overall requirement is that it meets the standards they need to be of a sufficient quality that I have confidence in the field work that's going to be undertaken it needs to be detailed enough so um, that it's it has that level of information that I can make a decision from them. So, and that goes for not just WSIs, it goes for the DBAs, it goes for heritage statements, it goes for all of the reports. If you've got a report that comes into me and it doesn't have the correct level of information, it means that I can't do my job effectively. And my job is to manage the historic environment on behalf of the people of Coventry. 
they pay their taxes, their taxes pay for me. So I'm effectively employed by them. So I have to maximize the, the information on their behalf. Uh, yeah, obviously it needs to be fit for purpose and appropriate as well. So I'll just, yeah. Why? Uh, no, uh, that, that's my typical um, condition uh, uh, thing. So basically, why? Uh, actually, I'll just back to this one. Why is it important that we have this? So, because it's my it, this information is for me to make a decision, um, and if that isn't fit for purpose, I can't make a decision. Now, it's fairly easy to go back to a DBA and say, yeah, that's not, not sufficient. I can't make a decision. It's quite cheap and quick for them to go and look at my comments, revise the DBA, save heritage statements if their assessment of significance isn't up to scratch, if their setting assessment isn't fit for purpose. It's a fairly cheap, quick process to, to rectify that. It's not so much for field work. That is why I have to, because I'm prioritising my workload, my resources, that's why the focus for these is on WSIs. Because that's not a cheap thing to fix. If they send in a trenching report and I say, well, yeah, no, you've left it at the top of the alluvium, why didn't you go through the alluvium? It's going to be expensive, time consuming, and their client is not going to be happy because it means that they probably won't be able to hit their planning uh, committee deadlines. They'll have to push it back and yeah, they won't be happy. So we need to ensure that that level of work is done correctly. And also that's the part that harms the archaeology. A DBA, if done poorly, yeah, we can rectify it. Trenching done poorly, you may destroy the archaeology. It also protects the uh, applicants, the applicants' clients, because then if they have a good idea of the archaeology, they'll have a good idea of the cost of the archaeology. They can factor that in, and they can factor it in into their timeframes. A poorly undertaken piece of field work means that their their next stages may be woefully um, underfunded or or they may not have the time to do that level of work so it has to be undertaken within a series of criteria so proportionality consistent reasonable measurable Site specific, one size doesn't fit all. Flexible, and the last two is me. I heavily recommend that people consult with me before doing their WSI so they can get an accurate idea of the scope. And I'm always picky. So I'll send back a WSI if I don't think it's correct. And then if they send it back to me without something, um, or maybe the wording's wrong, because you never know when you will need that level of accuracy. So you can't leave it to chance. So yeah, and there's there's some of the, um, uh, the standards and uh, the guidance that we do use. Obviously, offshore wind farms isn't really applicable applicable to Coventry, <clears throat> but certainly the rest of them are. And a lot of the guidance, the CFA stuff, has obviously been around for a while. But some of the the, the historic England Heans and GPAs are, that are coming out and are really useful, and they're, they're up to date. And so obviously, it's quite a good time for the CFA to be looking at their guidance to see if they update those. Proportionality, I don't expect you to read that. <laughs> I'll be impressed if you can. That is the C for requirements for the contents of WSI within the standard of guidance for field evaluation. It's quite a lengthy uh, amount of information. And if I'm looking at, to be honest, I wouldn't expect all of that to be in fully in a WSI. It needs to be proportionate. So, obviously, you've got the things that every WSI needs, uh, be it a tiny watching brief on somebody's house extension. If it's a large linear trenching scheme, if it's a strip map and record, you've got the basics that you need. So, non-technical summary, geological background, um, methodology, archaeological background, archiving, post-ex, reporting, etc., etc., that all needs to be that needs to be in everything. This includes things like research objectives. 
but I'll go on about a bit more about that later. Effectively, what I want from a WSI <clears throat> is it for it to be a standalone document. So I don't expect you to repeat the full desk-based assessment, but you need to have sufficient information to, for somebody to pick that up that document and understand why I've asked for the work to be done. So yeah, synopsis of the DBA. You can obviously point towards DBA, definitely reference it. Um, fairly hot on bibliographies as well. Uh, but yeah, they all need to be in. The things that are more site specific, uh, contractor specific, timetables, sometimes you get WSI in months in advance of field work. So if it's gonna be a, a predetermination conditions, quite often they'll put the WSI in early, trying to get a discharge or condition. My condition specifically states that yes, you can have a partial discharge, but the full discharge won't occur until all phases of field work and reporting have been completed. Um, <clears throat> staffing, Sometimes you get WSIs done on behalf of um, uh, a different unit or a, co a consultant would do the WSI to hand out for um, tender to, to field work units. So they are highly variable. Statement on training and CPD. If it's a uh, freelance archeologist doing a watching brief, I'm not really gonna ask them to, d to hand out their entire CPD log uh, in a WSI. Con uh, equally, if it's a large SMR, um, I'll want some details on how they are going to sort of like be doing mentoring or training up of the junior staff, aspirational things, things that are contained in the code of conduct. We want that included in the website because I want to be sure that their the fieldwork staff, their aspirations and their training are taken into account in the fieldwork. I want to see demonstrable evidence of that. So in public engagement, again, little tiny watching brief, negligible. A large uh, field work project. Uh, obviously, uh, we want to see that. So, uh, and and it is. We are talking about public engagement, public benefits. So, uh, and I think uh, the quite of these that I'll go into a bit more detail. Um, so, research aims. Every project has them. Every project needs them. It's a requirement of MPPF, in my view. MPPF states local plan authorities should require developers to record an advance understanding of the significance of any heritage assets to be lost. A grey lit report doesn't fulfil that in my view. It may partially, but you need to put in that work to set it into its context. So if you have, but again, it's got to be proportional. So if you've got a site where you've got three ridge, uh, pieces of furrows in the trenches, a field drain and um, field boundary, the research value of that is going to be limited but equally if you've found a burnt mound that opens up so much more potential for additional consideration within the wider context so how's it uh, geographically topo topography looking at that uh, is the dis distribution of burnt mounds within coventry compared with the west midlands and the east midlands how does it fit um, uh, uh, and yet yeah, you can put in much more so the, again, that's, this is going back to proportionality and flexibility. So the caveat within a, um, a WSI normally that I ask for is that depending on the nature of the archeology span found, the, um, the West Midlands archeological frameworks will be utilized um, and, and then, and we'll leave it at that. If we know what we're looking for, then obviously we can go further. We can target specific aims and objectives. Public engagement. I get really annoyed when I see a WSI that just says so there are no opportunities for public engagement as part of this project. There are so many different types and ways to undertake public engagement. Social media is the massive one. So, uh, and yeah, it may not be feasible to do a site visit, an open day, um, but you can bring in it at like Finds Fridays, things like that. So you, you can highlight the archaeology and then obviously you can talk about it at um, um, meetings and things. So we've got a couple of um, archaeology groups. We've got CADAS, we've got the West Midlands CBA um, in Coventry that are quite active. I've given talks to them. I believe Matt's given talks to, uh, to them. So. Um, there are plenty of opportunities for that level of public engagement and we are in this for the public benefit. So just to have a great literature report and keep this quiet about the site, it, it just doesn't fit well.
So I like to see, again, we may not be able to fully put out in the um, WSI what we're going to do, but the flexibility, proportionality, so the caveat, the, the, the clause will be that I, depending on the results of the archaeological works, it may be that additional phases of public engagement um, and dissemination are discussed uh, with the client, the archaeological co contractor and me. So, so that covers it um, fairly well for, for unexpected deli um, deliveries, uh, discoveries. Dissemination, yeah, again, Greylit report, that's a requirement. So uh, in NPPF, obviously, it states that uh, the results of field work should be made publicly available as a minimum within the, uh, as an, to the HER. <clears throat> so yeah, we'll go to the HER again. We may have more, we'll go into the local field work roundup. But if we have significant remains, then yeah, we may be looking at um, standalone publication. Uh, it's possible that it may be a synthetic publication. So if we have a, <clears throat> a number of sites near to each other, we'll publish those as a corpus of information. That has obviously funding implications, um, which we'd, we'd need to consider, but again, it's something that uh, we'll come across. I haven't actually had to come across it yet, but uh, I think that we've got some sites which may be sort of like teetering on the edge of um, a higher level of publication, whether that's going to be one of the uh, local regional journals or a standalone um, publication, we'll, we'll have to see. Just make sure I've not missed anything. So yeah, see for guidance that I require. <clears throat> Most of it's... Um, Fairly new, so I mean, you, the dig digital uh, material. Uh, every WSI that I have uh, receive, I require that has a digital data management plan. So if they don't get that, it gets sent back. So please add one of those in. Um, archives, the toolkits. Sometimes, um, if the site's small enough, I'll even ask for them to um, cover the sterile archaeological archives. Uh, because that may well be uh, come into play, um, particularly right for the for the small watching briefs and things. <clears throat> the uh, fine, fines toolkits as well; they're always a requirement. So, uh, and also, I mean, it, depending on the site, there will be other needs. So, I think I had the curating the Paleolithic. So, I mean, if we suspect there's going to be Paleolithic remains, that'll be added in Mesolithic frameworks and things. The Roman tool, um, uh, coins toolkit. As I say, we've got very little Roman, or, or until recently we had very little Roman material within commentary. We're actually, we're getting more of it now. So that's, so again, it's going to be on a site by site basis. Local requirements, obviously, the, the Herbert Museum is the, the, the um, archive for archaeological material. They have their own um, requirements, so I send those out. <coughs> Uh, when I'm uh, when I'm sort of uh, consulting or being consulted, so the transfer of title things. The other one for uh, for us is the Wiltshire Fabric Series, and that allows a that's a requirement for any work within Coventry for medieval post medieval pottery. This allows uh, much better options for research <clears throat> for the uh, the medieval and later ceramics because obviously different units normally have different fabrics uh, uh, ways of recording the things and because we use the fabric series that allows that consistent recording and reporting level across Warwickshire uh, and because commentary is effectively part of Warwickshire it's a requirement and, uh, and it, it helps I think. Common mistakes. Um, not consulting is one of them, obviously, because if you've uh, attended something and you don't know the scope accurately, then that's going to be an issue. Um, use of the old size of templates, the main one as well. There's numerous times that you've got, I uh, looked at them and they've got the wrong county, you've got the wrong archives, you've got the wrong curator. Um, so it is, yeah, it's an issue. Um, certainly the consultation, again, that's important. Sometimes, if a WSI has been done and approved a couple of years ago, it may well be it needs updating. So, I mean, we've changed, I've changed the level of trenching um, um, following sort of like consultations. That's increased. So, uh, a WSI from like two years ago will probably have uh, my predecessor's level of trenching and that's increased now. 
<clears throat> it may be we found additional sites from uh, more recent work nearby, and so we need to factor that in. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, uh, that's. Yep. Yeah, mistakes. I'm almost done. Oh, yeah, I am done. <laughs> and yeah, as a basic, as I say, as Jen said, yeah, Coventry. This is the Coventry viewpoint. Coventry is a bit strange because there was no handover, so it's been a, a process of learning. Uh, I didn't have the the one uh, the curator before me left three months before I started, so it's it's been a bit of a journey, but we're slowly getting there, and that's why the the requirements for the WSIs have evolved over time. So, but hopefully, yeah, that that's uh, the Coventry stance. <clears throat>